Welcome back. Wednesday morning, right in the middle of the week. Let's get you up to date with the stocks which are in the news. Our research team is standing by. And on top of the list, we're going to be talking about IOC and macro tech developers. Sonal joins in with the latest. Sonal, hi, good morning. Good morning, Reema. Well, for IOC, as expected, the company has gone ahead. The board has approved fundraising. They will have uh, a meeting on the 7th of June where they will consider rights issue as well. And this is something which was expected as well. They will be doing it for CapEx requirements. Now, do remember last week itself, BP Sales board had approved raising up to 18,000 crore rupees through rights issue. And now all eyes are on HPCL. And City had come out with an interesting note where they said HPCL case is more curious given no direct government holding in the company. Uh, they await details on the modality of its capital raise and of course our government had spoken about infusing some capital in these three companies. So two of them have announced this. The third one is something we are waiting, uh, watching out for. For Macrotech developers, they have come out with their quarter one update where uh, pre-sales were strong. However, collections dipped on a quarter on quarter and on a YY basis. Pre-sales were up 17% on a YY basis. Collections up uh, 8% YY. Net debt has si slightly increased because of project additions and also lower collections uh, and they have added five new projects having 7.1 million square feet of saleable area so pre-sales is strong some dip in collections on the back of which the stock will be in focus today okay all right thanks a lot for that so now well uh, let's hop across to abhishek he's joining in to tell us about uh, HDFC Bank's quarter one update. Morning, Abhishek. Morning, Nigel. So it looks like a weak uh, number, especially on the loan growth front. Uh, net interest margin could be under pressure given the fact that cost of fund is rising and you are losing out on CD ratio. So a merge number, that is HDFC Bank and HDFC Limited, over there the deposit growth is 16.2% YOY and about 1.2% sequentially. The loan growth of merge entity is about 13% YOY and about 0.66% quarter on quarter. Coming on to the standalone numbers of HDFC Bank uh, without HDFC Limited numbers. Uh, deposit growth is at 19.2% YOY and about 1.6% sequentially. The CASA ratio is at 42.5% when compared to 44.4% in the previous quarter. This is at 11th quarter low and the advances growth is at 15.8% YOY and about 0.9% sequentially. So sequentially or quarter on quarter the loan growth is the lowest that you are seeing in last 26 quarters. CD ratio has declined to 84.45% when compared to around 85% in the previous quarter which is at a 12 quarter low uh, in itself so the stock could be uh, under pressure in trade today back to you okay Abhishek uh, thanks very much uh, for that that's HDFC but uh, there are other banks which have reported first quarter pre quarterlies as well you've got uh, I think Indescent AU small finance bank Abhishek take, take us through uh, those numbers as well uh, well, Prashant, to begin with, industry in bank, the loan growth is pretty strong. However, the CASA ratio is at 24 quarter low. Deposits have grown by 14.5% YOY and about 3.25% quarter on quarter. The CASA ratio has dipped below 40% for the first time in last six years that I am seeing their number. So it's at 24 quarter low of 39.9% when compared to 40.1% in the previous quarter. Loan growth remains healthy at 21.4% YOY and about 3.8% sequentially. AU Small Finance Bank over there the deposit growth is weak however loan growth is strong deposits are up nearly 27 percent yoy and almost flat on a sequential basis advances growth is at 29 percent yoy and about seven and a half percent quarter on quarter so cd ratio has improved both yoy and quarter on quarter cost of funds has inched up by almost 30 basis point quarter on quarter and the casa ratio has uh, dipped sharply to 35 percent versus more than 38 uh, percent in the previous quarter rbl bank the deposit growth is weak uh, deposit are up 8.1% YOY and about 0.9% sequentially. Loan growth is pretty healthy at more than 20% YOY and about 4% sequentially. So the CD ratio has improved both YOY and quarter on quarter. CASA ratio is at 37.3% when compared to 37.4% in the previous quarter. Bandhan Bank, the net interest margin could be under pressure. Uh, deposits have grown by 16.6% YOY and about 0.4% quarter on quarter. But the CASA ratio has declined sharply to 36% versus 36 39.3% in the previous quarter. Even the loan book is down massively by 5.5% quarter on quarter. So the CD ratio has declined to 95% versus 101% in the previous quarter. And we also have a resignation. CFO has resigned. So that could also weigh on the stock price today. Back to you. Thank you very much for that. Yesterday, we had Bandhan Bank a bit subdued in trade, down close to about 2%. I'm watching Samvardhan Madhusan Sumi. The company has made two acquisitions. One of them is called Yachio. Now, Yachio is a subsidiary of Honda and Madison Sumi will be acquiring an 81% stake in Yachio. 
the balance will be held by Honda. There is another small acquisition called Prism, but there the company will be investing only about $14 million initially. Now, about Yachio, because that's a significant acquisition. One, the valuation price appears to be fairly reasonable. The company is going to be paying 145 million euro. The acquired company had revenues of about 840 million euros. So one, the acquisition price is attractive. Secondly, with this acquisition, the company forays into the sunroof segment where the company currently does not have any presence. Yachio globally has a market share of close to about 9% in sunroof. So the acquisition helps uh, Samvardhan Madhusan Sumi diversify into fuel tank, sunroof segment. This is the pro forma analysis. And thirdly, it gives them greater entry uh, penetration into the Japanese OEM market and plus they will have Honda as a strong client for them because remember, Honda will continue to hold about a 19% stake in Yachio. So these are the three key takeaways. Valuation attractive, helps them foray into new segments like sunroof, and they will have, they, this acquisition can enable greater penetration with Japanese OEMs, particularly Honda. Catch the management of Sambardhan Madison at 9.50 on Bazaar today. Okay, let's uh, move on and talk, go to Ikta for more updates on strides and synergy. Ikta. Thanks for that. Well, yes, an interesting deal which has taken place. Stellis is going to be divesting its Unit 3 multimodal facility for 702 crores to Sinjin. Remember, Stellis is Stride's uh, Biopharma CDMO arm. The consideration is going to be settled in cash by Sinjin. It'll take around 90 days to close this transaction. For Sinjin, it is important they are on an uptrend. The facility, which was initially built to manufacture COVID-19 vaccines, will now be repurposed. Sinjin is going to invest around 100 crores. It will help strengthen their position in biologic CDMO. Stellis in Q4, remember the company had indicated to us, Strides had indicated that they are looking at strategic options for Stellis. The total amount of debt which was paid by the group was 720 crores in FY23. The company is in fact confident of reducing the net debt to EBITDA to less than 3x versus an exit runway rate of 3.4 times in FY23. So the proceeds might in fact help in terms of the overall debt reduction. The company Stellis will continue to expand via Unit 2 as well as Unit 1. Unit 2 is already USFT approved and multiple regulatory agencies have approved it. So overall, it is a win-win both for Sinjin, which will expand into biologic CDMO, as well as Stellis, which is going to get in money in order to uh, reduce debt as well as look at the other opportunities. Expect both the stocks to be in the green. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot for that, uh, Ekta. Well, let's hop across to Surbi to wind this down with some more stocks in the news. Surbi? Morning, Nigel. So first on my radar is Genus Power. The company, along with GIC, will invest around $2 billion to build a smart metering solutions platform. Now, in this platform, GIC will hold around 74% stake and Genus Power will hold the other 26%. Genus will be the exclusive supplier to this platform and the platform will bid for smart meter projects in India. Additionally, another GIC affiliate will invest 520 odd crores in Genus Power for 15% stake through stock warrants. So that will be on our radar. Uh, Suzlon Energy, another one on our radar because they are going to be a board meet on 7th July to consider a capital raise. And we'll also watch out for LIC Housing Finance as the company will replace HDFC in the Nifty Financial Services Index with effect from July 13th. Okay, thank you very much for that. A quick recap then of the top stocks. Stocks with positive news flow are IOC, Micro Macrotech Developers, Samvarth and Madison, Strides Pharma, Sinjin International, Genus Power, Suzlon Energy, LIC Housing Finance. While HDFC Bank is the only stock with negative news flow. And the other bank stocks are likely to open neutral. Not done just yet. We've got Ekta back with us to give us the brokerage update for the day. Ekta. Thanks for that. Well, I'll start with a couple on Hero Moto. Jeffries has written they have a buy call. They've raised their target price to 3,500. According to them, the X440 provides an attractive proposition for customers. CLSA has a sell call target 2708 on Hero. They've said that there is, it is an attractive price point which could help Hero gain share in the 250cc plus segment. 
Competitive intensity, however, is increasing in the two-wheeler segment as well. JP Morgan has written on KPIT Technologies underweight target price 540. For them, uh, they expect the company to clock a 20% growth beyond FI24, which is what the stock is pricing in over the next decade on a reverse DCF. However, JP Morgan continues to argue it will need to win one mega deal every year, which they believe is optimistic. To assume so a bit of caution coming in there and lastly city has written on Naveen Floro they've initiated with a buy and a target price of 5600 they think the company has multiple levers in place to drive industry leading growth all right uh, Ekta, thanks very much uh, for that uh, and uh, that's basically the list of stocks that you need to watch out for as we st uh, start today's session we'll take a quick commercial break here Devin Choksi of KR Choksi will join in for some fundamental stock analysis later, we'll connect with the management of Texmaco Rail and Engineering to discuss uh, the business outlook with them. Stay with us. Welcome back. Asia is a bit on the back foot. Hang Seng is currently down 1%. You've got the Chinese markets under pressure. Uh, the Japanese markets have retreated close to about 0.3%. It's red on the screen for the Korean markets, but the GIF Nifty is currently suggesting a flat start. We've had six days of gains on the trot. The Nifty scaled record levels even yesterday. On an intraday basis, even 60, uh, 9, 19,400 was scaled, but by the close of trade, it was a rally of 66 points, though the momentum in the broader markets appear to have waned a tad bit. Today, we're going to get two important launches. So just to quickly put them on the screen, one of them is from Maruti, and that's going to take place at uh, 11.30, Invictus.
This is going to be Maruti's first launch in the 20 lakh plus uh, category. So they will be foraying into that. So the street will be watching Invicto. Sorry, not Invictus. Invicto is the name. And the other one is the Bajaj Triumph launch. Uh, I think 1 p.m. Uh, at Chakan, uh, our colleague Parikshit will be there. And we will get to know more about the pricing. Um, the look is already revealed in London. But um, people out here will get to touch and feel and physically uh, see the bike and probably even test ride it. But pricing is going to be very crucial for Bajaj Triumph. Uh, let's uh, invite Devin Choksi of Kia Choksi Securities on the show now. Devin, any chance you look at Genus Power? It's a stock which has been scaling record levels yesterday. I think in the last, if you pull up a six-month chart, you would see in the last three months, the stock price has gone from levels of 80, 90 all the way to 140, getting large orders and now this investment by GIC. Good morning, Rima. No, I haven't looked at this particular company, so I'll excuse myself from giving any comments. Okay. Uh, Suzlon is looking at a fundraise next week on, I think, the 7th of uh, July. Suzlon has also been re-rated. Uh, now money is coming in. Is this a stock that you've looked at? Yes, I think that's a company which is probably I think, sounding much better and looking much better now. Uh, frankly, I think the fundamentals of the company were always there. They even accept the problems. I think they ran into with the policies and thereafter, I think the indisciplined working capital management, I would think. I guess I think that part is now taken care of. Balance sheet is repaired. At the same time, the order book remains, I think, quite healthy. At least I think next one and a half year, two years of visibility is being seen as far as order book is concerned currently. And as I see the stability in the policy environment, I would like to believe that uh, going forward, the uh, business situation remains, I think, literally more favorable to Suzlon than ever before. At the same time, I think capitalization in the balance sheet, I think, is sounding well because largely that is a factor which was missing in this company. And probably if that is so, then maybe uh, three, six months down the line, I think you could be seeing a higher amount of conviction happening in the uh, minds of investors from adding this particular stock in their portfolio. So, yes, I think this company looks relatively better than before. Okay, all right. Hi, Devin. Good morning. Uh, Devin, I wanted to ask you about HDFC Bank. You know, that's been the poster boy, actually, of this recent uh, rally that we've seen. After being an underperformer, it's come to the party, and now we're going to have one large entity out there. We have an update that's come in in terms of their operational performance, and it seems on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis, our colleague Abhishek tells us that it's not that great in terms of growth. It's just a 1% growth, and that in turn could put pressure on NIMS. How do you approach the stock from these levels? Valuation-wise, well, numerous brokerages have maintained that it's trading at a discount in comparison to its averages. So, Nigel, uh, <clears throat> considering the fact that this company has been in the process of merger with HDFC, I think that is a reason for which I think there has been a relatively slow amount of growth in the loan uh, book as I see it. Otherwise, I think the uh, on the ground, when you meet the company, you find that I think they are absolutely very, very charged up. On the contrary, I believe that corporate loan book, I think, which is growing at around 20% rate of growth for the company, and so is the case with many of the private sector lenders, corporate lenders. At the same time, uh, uh, along with that, the retail loan book also is growing at the rate of around 20%. And with the merged company, uh, even housing finance loan book is uh, going to be at around 20% rate of growth on a yearly basis. So from a perspective of looking at this company from the long-term investment as a merge entity, I feel that I think they hold significantly large amount of uh, opportunity in the potential. The deposit base is around 16 17% growth as we have seen in this particular quarter numbers. In my viewpoint, I think this is going to grow further. Uh, and as a result of which, the bank looks, I think, reasonably well placed as far as I think the investment opportunity goes. Maybe I think the, it has run up in a while back. So obviously, I think some amount of price correction may take place. But I think that would be inviting more amount of investment interest from long-term investors. Uh, Devin, hi, morning. Uh, you know, it's all financials today. Uh, so two things. One is uh, Bajaj Finance. Is there more after yesterday's big move? Uh, that is uh, the first talk. And second, we had more updates, right, from Indusan Bank. They reported the pre-quarterly uh, set. We had uh, Bandhan Bank, AU Bank. Uh, anything uh, sticks out to you? Yes, Prashant. Good morning. Well, uh, I think as I was making a point, I think most of the credits uh, are growing. You know, corporate credit is growing, retail credit is growing, housing finance credit is growing. So I think that is definitely uh, influencing some of the larger players, including companies like Bajaj Finance, where uh, the respective portfolios within the uh, retail segment of lending 
is systematically growing for the company. In fact, I think more and more they are earning larger amount of market share in each and every portfolio of lending in the retail uh, credit book size. So obviously, 30-32% kind of a growth that they are reporting. In my viewpoint, I think given the strategy that they have adopted, including the uh, the strengthened uh, omni-channel presence, I think which they have created by way of putting in the marketplace platform, which is a super app for them, is basically likely to uh, generate higher amount of loan disposal and that to at an efficient cost, which is fundamentally very important. So obviously, on one side, your loan book is growing. On the other side, the efficiency is also simultaneously taken care of, which would probably result into faster disposal at the same time, lower cost of uh, operations. So one needs to remain bullish about this particular company and the prospects there. Mm. Uh, Devain, do stay on. We've got a management waiting by to chat with us. Texmaco Rail and Engineering. The company has given a 30 to 35 percent revenue growth guidance for FY24, and they also expect a 25 to 30 percent production ramp up in the first half of this year. Indrajeet Mukherjee, Executive Director and Vice Chairman at Texmaco Rail and Engineering, is with us here to talk about the way forward. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Mukherjee, if you could give us an update on the Vande Bharat train orders, you were L3 in the order, I understand. But there are reports which suggest that the L1 bidder, RVNL, and the Russian partners, JV, has been broken. Well, I we uh, I have to make very clear that we didn't participate in the RVNL. Uh, I'm sorry, in the Vande Bharat uh, tender. But I also this is an in, new in, new this is an information that uh, I also have heard that there has been some problem uh, regarding the RVNL. That's all I have heard from the newspaper, and so I have absolutely no uh, knowledge of what's happening there. Okay, got that, sir. Uh, but what if it comes comes up for rebidding? Uh, is it a possibility that then you all will uh, look to participate? Well, uh, I wouldn't like to talk very specific about this particular uh, uh, subject of rebidding, but I would like to tell you that our vision and our stra future strategic plan is to move from freight mobility to passenger mobility. So this definitely fits into our uh, 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 vision. The issue is that whether we have gathered, gathered sufficient competencies to do that, because we are in the railway business, we have lots of co competences in the mobility, but we, had, we, we have, it's not that we haven't done uh, passenger mobility, we have built, built EM, EMU coaches uh, long back, but that's uh, about 12 or 15 years back. So we need to uh, really look at that, but we, we have our eyes on all the passenger mobility business opportunities. Mm. Uh, so you would have uh, given a broader top-down look at, uh, you know, the bids, et cetera, which they came in, right? I mean, I think the <clears throat> they, they came in at about 120 crores for each, tra each train set. Uh, I remember reading uh, an interview with Mr. S. Mani, who, was, who designed uh, the Vande Bharat uh, train sets, uh, who's now retired, uh, saying uh, when the first of the bids were given out, uh, he said that, uh, you know, they, they seem to be uh, almost unviable uh, because of, 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 of uh, the player, which is in a joint venture, the Russian company, and maybe he was referring to the pricing as well. Uh, any thoughts at all, sir? Uh, will be a very tough call for me because uh, I haven't really looked at the costing, uh, so it will be very difficult for, for us to make a comment whether... The price is good or bad. So the reason you didn't participate in the Vande Bharat tender in the first place is because you believe you did not have the competency, the capability currently. It's not an account of pricing. That's very, very correct. I think we are, we are in the process of building our competencies. We are looking at various aspects. And I think you will very soon see us uh, uh, being an aspirant in this uh, segment. You're going to be, uh, are you going to be tying up with uh, a company with the required competencies uh, to, to, to do this, to participate in this space? As you know that we do not have all the, uh, all the requirements mm. for, uh, and for building it because primarily we are wagon builders. So we are a strong company which is strong in fabrication. And also we know the technology on the railways. But there are certain uh, missing gaps. 
and obviously we have to either develop ourselves or we have to look for uh, outside tie-ups and we would prefer the second one outside tie-ups anything in particular we should expect sir in the near future uh, it is too early to say but we are uh, looking uh, to various options and i hope uh, it will be not too long when i'll be able to uh, happily come and talk to you and announce you what's happening so do you think by next year you would have the required capabilities the expertise the partnership in place for you to go ahead and bid for passenger train uh, tenders give us some I, timeline I, you know because I, this is I, your aspiration i absolutely correct i think i'd be happy if you could do it before one next year okay so you know in the next 12 months within the next 12 months we should see Texmaco Rail participating in the passenger train bids. Sir, could you give us an update on how the quarter has been? You all have given us a guidance of uh, 30 to 35 percent revenue growth in FI24. Based on what we've seen in the first three months, will you be able to maintain this revenue growth projection? Uh, I think we should be able to do it because unless there are there are many um, uh, slippages between the cups and the lips, but I think we should be able to do it because, uh, as you know, that. we don't have a problem of uh, order book we have an order book which runs into uh, almost 8000 crores uh, we have uh, when when initially the order came to us there were hitches because uh, of various uh, reasons one of the reason was the ecosystem which are the sub- our supply system they didn't pick up and then we had uh, uh, a very a uh, large number of uh, closed wagons to be made which are more difficult than making the uh, the the generic open type wagons so these are all the challenges which we have uh, uh, we had to pass through uh, there were also problem with the supply of the wheel sets from the railway wheel factory and i think that's all now history so uh, barring certain very unprecedented situation i am very confident that we would be sticking to our guideline all right uh, we'll leave it there sir thank you very much for joining us and uh, good luck we look forward to speaking with you soon uh, as uh, and when you announce those uh, tie ups i mean that's the first thing to look forward to uh, 76 rupees on tixmaco well we'll take a quick commercial break here we are coming back anuj will be with us with uh, the trade setup as he sees it and of course our technical and fno experts on the other side see with us
Welcome back. Hope you're having a good morning. Well, uh, the gift nifty, that's suggesting a bit of a flattish start, as flat as can be. But uh, rest assured, as we have seen in the last many days, we'll swing one of the two ways. So let's see how that goes. But we're still in conversation with uh, Devin Choksi. Uh, Devin, I wanted to ask you about uh, Dixon Technologies. You know, the stock had a big run, more than 50%, I think, in the last uh, few months. But Jefferies has come out of the note and they've downgraded the stock. A couple of reasons that they highlight is the stock is now trading at close to around 60 times its forward earnings. And the second factor is bulk of their book is towards OEM, that's 75%, which is lower margins. How do you approach the stock from these levels? Bulk of the good news in the price or is there more in store? Yeah, I think the second point I think which you referred in the note of Jefferies, I think that is uh, more obvious and I think that is known. So I think that's not a surprise. And that should not be the reason for downgrading the stock because on this very reason, I think the I think the price picked up. The larger concern remains about uh, the kind of valuation that this particular stock has uh, assumed once again. In my viewpoint, I think if you give stretch valuation and if you mature this valuation ahead of time, possibly I think the shareholder will not earn the return. The company will continue to make profits because I think they've got the contractual obligations to deliver. So from that perspective, I believe that I think the business will continue to deliver profits. However, I think the valuation remains stretched. And unless I think we have price corrections through time correction, I think we will not see I think, a major rally uh, in this particular stock. That is one thing which is given. Okay, well, you know, that entire pack, Dixon, Amber, Sirma, Keynes, Avalon, I mean, you know, huge moves uh, on uh, the entire pack over the last three months or so. Uh, then uh, stay with us. We're just coming back to you. Anuj is here in the studios with uh, how he's seeing uh, things set up this morning. Anuj, morning. Morning, Prashant. Uh, well, it's uh, raining heavily, right? And it's raining good news in the market also. All-time highs and the market just keeps seeing FI buying. Now, you know what? Yesterday I was uh, talking to Samir Arora and the point he was making is that, you know, we have very strong FI buying because a lot of money is shifting from China to India and uh, that is something which could continue. Uh, while the Indian market is now approaching 20 times price to earnings, uh, historically we peak out at 22 times, but then who's to say that we won't get re-rated, uh, uh, the kind of macro that uh, you know we are, we are showing right now. Uh, 18,000 to 19,000 took 21 months and uh, 19,000 to 20,000 looks like would be at the uh, Phase of a bullet train. Uh, of course, you need to keep uh, reviewing your portfolio. I mean, you know, I want to uh, say a few things about the setup today because while there's been quite a bit of FI buying, about 2,100 crores in cash market, there's also buying in index futures by about 1173 crores. And the long buildup uh, is now at 13,820 contracts. Uh, net long, we are at 72% now. We were at 66% at the start of the series. And net long uh, buildup now from FIs is 90,000 contracts. Now, remember, in the month of March, uh, there was, we were 91% short and 1.5 lakh contracts on the short side. So, you know, who's to say that this number cannot emulate that on the long side? Uh, so, uh, the market's been very strong. And all you need to do is now perhaps keep trailing your stop loss and let the market decide your exit. The base has now moved to 19,200. Fresh entry zone, if the market's luck, if you're lucky, perhaps 19,250 to 19,300. That's been the low of the last two days. Uh, uh, but overall, it's been a very strong market. Though there was yesterday some signs that in the mid-cap there was some profit taking. But that will keep happening at lifetime highs. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot uh, for that, uh, Anuj. Well, let's move on, get in a couple of uh, technical calls for the day. Prakash Kaba as well as Sudarshan Sukhani joined us this morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Well, Sudarshan, uh, you go first. Tell us what's the view on the index it's been a super run in the last few sessions. How would you trade the index from here? Yeah, good morning. Well, the market is in a strong uptrend. And when we are in a strong uptrend, the only trade is to go long and buy the nifty. Now, the decision is a tactical decision where to buy and when to exit. Yesterday, for the first time after many, many days, the nifty suggested that perhaps it is entering into a consolidation. So my view would be, that you wait for a 150, 200 point dip and then buy the nifty or uh, it depends on how the markets behave, but wait for an intraday dip. Your stop should be somewhere around 19,200. Whenever you find an intraday dip, go along with that stop loss. Again, the bank nifty is not participating in the same uh, situation. It's been moving sideways for three, four days now. The bank nifty is best avoided. Focus on buying the nifty. Uh, gentlemen, good morning. Uh, Prakash, uh, you'd uh, <coughs> share that view uh, that maybe at yesterday's close, there was a, <coughs> a doji emerged as well, right? I mean, uh, so maybe we are entering a bit of a 
a consolidatory kind of price action or you think this runaway train will continue? Well, good morning to you, Prashant. Well, basically, there is a doji out there, no doubt about it. A. B, it's also we saw four gaps on the way up. Now, four gaps is too much to ask for. Last four trading sessions, every day there's a gap. Even yesterday was a gap, though it, it closed it closed the gap. So I feel that four, if it becomes fifth today, there'll be caution time. When, when I say caution, caution doesn't mean that you sell. Maybe we need some kind of a correction. The correction could be two, time-wise correction or price-wise correction, or maybe both. So far, it is heated. We could see a sideways move, and sideways move is a sign of strength. And we can again resume a journey up. So far, the trend is still intact up, has not been compromised. What are the support levels? I would look at maybe around 19,200, 19,250, where it opened up a gap. As long as the gap is there, there is strength. So dips are viable. As far as bank nifty is concerned, I would say 44,800. Very strong support to deal with. If a dip comes until then, it's viable because the larger trend is still intact. Up. What would your uh, trades be, Prakash? I like two stocks here. Infosys I've been liking since Monday. It's been trading into a sideways zone after that and trading at 1344 now. I have a feeling that Infosys can climb to 1375 to 1400 zone. It's a matter of time, a day or two. But it looks like there's strength in Infosys. The second stock that I like is Apollo Hospital. Shows some kind of a strength, some kind of a resilience, trading at a, uh, something like 5109. I would have a stop below 5075. And we'll see maybe a target to maybe around 5,200 zones. So Apollo Hospital also looks nice to me. Mm. Uh, Sudarshan, what would your stock recommendations be? Well, it's a mix today because I expect a period of consolidation. RT Industries is an intraday short. RT Industries has been falling. It has just broken a sub significant support level. And that's happening in a market that's rolling on the upside. So RT is an intraday short with a stop above 505. Another intraday short is Chambal Fertilizers. Have a look at the charts. Lower highs, lower lows, and consistent downtrend. It's fallen almost 20%. So that's an intraday short with a stop above 276. I have two buying ideas. One is HCL Technologies, a beautiful chart to look at if you are looking for an uptrend. It's been a steady up move. That steady up move should go up, should continue after a period of consolidation where we are now. Buy with a stop under 1175. My fourth stock for buying is uh, Kotak Bank. Now, that's not in an uptrend. It's actually had a deep correction. There is a sense that the correction may be ending. It's a chance, but buy with a stop under 1820. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for that. Get into a break. We'll come back with the pre-opening rates, and we'll also be joined uh, with Jitendra Agarwal of Genus Power Infrastructure to talk about their tie-up with GIC to build smart metering solution. Uh, you know, stay tuned for that interview. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we just what uh, a minute away from the pre-open session. Just uh, take a look at uh, the, and I think it makes sense to just uh, wait for the pre-open itself. Five point change in the gift nifty is absolutely flat. Rajesh Palvia is with us uh, to uh, talk to us about the futures and options side of things. He's of course with Access Securities. Rajesh, good morning. Good to have you with us here. Uh, you know, get, we get to you. I don't know if you heard from both Prakash and uh, uh, Sudarshan earlier saying that for the first time yesterday, we saw a little bit of a, a con, uh, sort of price action, which indicates maybe some consolidation, which, which is not a bad thing. 700 quick points in five sessions of the Nifty. Uh, what would you do? What are your recommendations? Uh, good morning, Prashant. So overall setup is on the bullish side. Yes, uh, there is a overbought trajectory. If you look at the PCR ratio, so it clearly shows that, you know, we are in overbought trajectory. But uh, this is the uh, behavior of uh, bull market, uh, we may remain in the overbought territory and the market can uh, consolidate at higher level and then uh, we will resume uh, again, you know, really on the upward side. So this could be the possible uh, scenario we can see in the coming trading session. But looking at the data setup in the previous session also, there was a long built up for Nifty as well as for Bank Nifty. Uh, uh, we have seen significant call unwinding for 19,300-19,350 strike. And again, uh, put writers have aggressively add their bets on 19,300 strike. 
so it clearly shows that you know base is continuously shifting higher and now the base is uh, moved towards 19 uh, 250 19300 zone based on the uh, uh, call put data. So we expect uh, that uh, Nifty is likely to exhibit further more bullishness from the current level. So to initiate uh, this upward momentum, uh, to play this uh, upward move, uh, we are initiating again to buy 19,350 call option, uh, which was close at around 78 rupees. So we are projecting target of 130 to 140 for this call option. Uh, one can keep this stop loss of uh, 55. So overall, uh, Nifty Bank Nifty setup is on the bullish side. So we are uh, still holding our bullish view. On the stocks front, uh, we expect uh, Sun Pharma to continue furthermore upside as uh, we look at the uh, setup for Sun Pharma. Stock closed almost year to day high in the previous session and long built up was there. So looking at the overall setup for Sun Pharma, we expect uh, Sun Pharma can continue furthermore upside. We are projecting target of uh, 1090 to 1100, keep stop loss of 1025. Another stock uh, that we like, that is ITC stock, is continuously moving in high top, higher bottom formation on the daily, weekly time frame. Stock is enjoying almost its all time high trajectory. Uh, we expect uh, ITC can uh, take a lead from a current level, and uh, we are projecting target of 485, 490, a uh, key stop loss of 458. And the third stock is from automobile space, that is uh, Hero Motor. Uh, clearly, we have seen a breakout and long built up uh, in the stock prices in the previous session. Uh, so, Hero Motor is buy for upside target of uh, 3050 to 3080. Keep a stop loss of uh, 2960 to buy Hero Motor also. Okay, all right, Rajesh, thanks so much for stopping by and filling us in with uh, your view on the index as well as on a couple of stock calls. But let's focus on one of the big movers, Genius Pa. Well, there are two pieces of news. One is that GIC will be putting in money into the company via preference issue. And the second one is they've entered into a partnership with GIC to build smart metering uh, solutions platform. Now, uh, and the, both companies together will invest close to $2 billion for this smart metering venture. Uh, to understand more about this, we have uh, Mr. Jitendra Agarwal, the Joint Managing Director who joins us on the show. Hi, Mr. Agarwal. Good morning and congratulations on this investment. We want to understand a couple of factors, though. One, from the preferential issue, you're going to get close to 500 crores. What will that money be used for? And also, you're talking about this platform has a pipeline of close to $2 billion. How much does the listed entity, Genius Pa, have to invest in that? Yeah, good morning, everyone. So these 590 crores will be uh, primarily used for the AMISP platform. As you rightly said, this platform will have two partners, GIC, comes with 74% and Genius comes with 26%. So this platform will be primarily used to take care of the AMISP market. There's a very large opportunity available in the country with 250 million meters to be installed in the next three to five years. So this platform is created to make the best use of this opportunity. So you're saying that the money that, you're, that the company will be getting from GIC, that 519 crores odd, will be in turn used for the JV. Is that correct? The, for as your contribution largely, in the JV, largely that will be used in the JV, and some portion will be used for the day-to-day -day needs. Okay, so but you have to put in close to five twenty million dollars, right? If the overall platform investment is two billion dollars, you have a twenty-six percent stake, which means your investment needs to be five twenty million dollars, and that's a lot higher than you know the five hundred crore or the GIC is putting in. So can you tell us how you will be putting in the balance money? So this this 500 crores is a just a, a one sort of a investment done by the GIC. But overall, the company has a very strong books. And this business, Genus comes as a system integrator. And when we come as a system integrator, a lot of our working capital is used for uh, funding this particular joint venture or this particular JV. So GIC comes as a financial partner, Genus comes as a system integrator, and together this platform is built to create 250, to, uh, to support the 250 million meters smart meter opportunity, and Mr. this Agarwal, $2 billion. Uh, yeah. uh, right, no, got, it, got it. No, just to uh, sort of tie in the numbers, uh, as my colleague said, you will need to, uh, there is a, is this all going to happen in a very staggered way? Uh, so that gives you time. Yeah. Uh, uh, could Absolutely. you tell us the time, talk us through the timelines? So it will take three to four years to uh, three to four years will be required for such kind of investments. Three to four years for this uh, this platform to get this money, the total two billion dollars from 
Uh, 74 percent from GIC and the rest from you. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so uh, okay. So you'll you'll put in money slowly and continue to bid through these platform for these orders uh, which the government is, uh, which uh, for these tenders which the government is putting out. That's the plan. Absolutely. That's the plan. Okay. And you said that this uh, f the 519 crores that is only the first tranche, which means you're open to getting more. You're open to diluting more. No, not right now. We are definitely not open to diluting more. All right. Uh, Mr. Agarwal, I just had a question. This entire, I mean, uh, GIC is going to be holding 15% in the company. Instead of doing this JVA, couldn't you have just, uh, you know, told them to make a bigger investment in the listed entity itself? And also at some point of time, post the JV picking up pace, will you look at bringing both these two entities together? That's the listed entity, Genius Power, which all the shareholders will be having a lot of interest in uh, understanding. And also this JV, once it scales up, will you bring it together? Could you merge it at some, some point of time? No, we are not looking to merge it at any point of time. There's a very clear understanding. We have to understand these two models. Genus Power is a system integrator. JV is okay. the platform. The platform is going to work for the AMISP projects, where Genus Power has the exclusive rights as a system integrator. So Listco will have a tremendous business opportunity as a system integrator. Okay. So you will listen. Uh, okay. No, uh, so, so for the uninitiated, could you break it down simply? Uh, the the listed entity will be a customer of this. Uh, will be a service provider to this platform. Absolutely, listed Got entity it. is the system integrator for this platform. Okay. Right. What kind of uh, so? What, just give us the size of the opportunity then, as you see it. Uh, you know, from this for the platform and for the company after this tie up. So the size of the opportunity, as I said, 250 million meters we are required in the next five years, which is very, very large. So what we envisage is at least 30 million meters in the next three years. That is the size of the opportunity. That is the kind of uh, business Genus and GIC are going to do through this platform. And what's the uh, value of each meter? If you do 30 million meters in the next three years, could you quantify that in rupees and crores? So meters are a very custom built product, but if you take a benchmark price, that comes around 3,000 to 3,500 rupees per meter. Okay, all right. Uh, and Mr. Agarwal, you know, in the near term, that's FI24, these ambitions are very, very good. And now you have an order book to back you up as well. But for FI24, what kind of revenues can you do? I think you were talking about 1,500 crores. Do you stick by that? And on that base, how, how much will you grow? What is the margin band you look at uh, from year on? And more importantly, your cash conversion days are very high, close to 300 days as of the last year. So what is the guidance on that? Three numbers, revenue, margins, and so, cash conversion days. On the revenue, as I have told earlier in the investor call also, we, we maintain the guidance of 1200 to 1400 crores. So the reason I'm not changing this guidance, because the order, though the order book is very good, but all these AMISP projects have started flowing in from the first uh, quarter of this calendar year and they take minimum six to nine months for the preparation for the development and before you get onto the ground and revenues start coming so from the last quarter of this financial year you will see a tremendous jump in the revenues so i maintain the same guidance when it comes to operating margins they will definitely improve we will surely be at the pre-covid levels and it will only grow uh, in the times to come so these right. are the two yeah, mr Agarwal, uh, ca cash conversion on the days, cash conversion, yeah on the cash conversion days this will improve significantly because this whole AMISP business model is changing. Earlier, we used to supply meters to the utilities directly, and then now there will be a direct debit facility to the platform, and platform will be investing to in the company. They will they will be paying us on time. So cash conversion days will come down significantly in the next six to nine months. Okay, uh, you know I don't know if I got a zero here or there, but you said three thirty million. You the platform should do thirty million meters. The new platform in the next three years, uh, that, that and you gave us a number of three thousand five hundred rupees per meter. That is uh, ten thousand crores uh, opportunity over three years. Is that the number? Only as a only as a manufacturer of electricity meters. Uh, for the so for this, uh, two, yeah. So you have to understand there are two opportunities in the front of Genus. Genus as a system integrator, Genus as a meter manufacturer. 
So in the list, when we do the whole work as a system integrator, this 3500 guidance or 3000 rupees guidance I'm giving you as a meter manufacturer. So that is the right. kind of opportunity in front of us as a manufacturer. But when you talk of a system integrator, this opportunity goes further higher. Mm. No, so uh, the manufacturer is the uh, is, is the list is is the uh, is the platform, the right? No, manufacturer is the list co. Okay, the ten thousand yes. crore revenue opportunity is for the uh, listed entity, and the, uh, the, and the system. Entity. Okay, and the system integrator is the uh, platform, and there you're saying that the revenue opportunity becomes larger. Uh, well, platform will be the AMISP. Hmm. And platform is going to do uh, the work as a AMISP where the system integration work will be done by the Listco company. And as an exclusive list, okay. uh, system integrator for the platform. Got it, sir. Got it. Uh, and you're saying that these two entities will remain separate. That is part of the agreement with GIC. There is no plan to uh, uh, you know, merge them uh, down the line or one picking up a stake in the other or anything of that sort. Completely separate uh, entities. Not currently. I all right, and Mr. Agarwal, just very quickly, that revenue number you gave for this year, some part of the street was talking about 1,500 crores. Uh, I think you mentioned something like 1,200 to 1,400 crores. Could you clarify on that? So, so as I gave the guidance earlier also, I don't want to be very ambitious on that okay. guidance. I'm maintaining the same guidance of 12 to 1,400 crores, and there's a very clear reason behind it. All these AMISP projects, they take six to nine months to come on the Got ground. It. So you will okay. see a tremendous revenue growth from the... Uh, end of this financial year. Okay. Uh, Mr. Garwal. Just, Rima, yeah, just one ahead. thing. You know, in, just in percentage terms, uh, very simply speaking, uh, out of uh, what percentage of the platform order value comes to the uh, company, the listed company, if you can give us that number? So, the percentage will hover anywhere from 60% to 70%. So, uh, out of 100 rupees order which the platform gets, 60 to 70 rupees can come to the listed entity. That's what you're telling us. Yes. So, this will be 1.2 billion dollars at least. Out of the 2 billion dollar opportunity. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Mr. Agarwal, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, good speaking with you. Uh, it's a pleasure having you with us here. And... Uh, uh, so that's the big uh, mover of the day yesterday. And of course, a very large transaction, one of its kind really uh, in the smart meter uh, sort of segment, uh, 154 on uh, that one. Uh, by the way, we're just uh, sort of uh, coming up to the market open, which is uh, going to be with us in just a bit. Uh, I think uh, Prakash... Uh, uh, all no, right, we've got uh, Sapna, Sapna joining, joining in. Us. There is a CNBC TV18 exclusive where sources tell us that the government is working on a cabinet approval for equity infusion into oil marketing companies. Sapna is here on the phone line with details. Sapna. Yeah, hi. Absolutely right. Uh, any kind of a capex infusion from the part of the government, uh, you know, it, it either works out like a rights issue or a potential issue. We have seen BDPL and IOC. Uh, you know, announcing rice issue for this uh, 30,000 odd crores uh, button announcement that was made in terms of energy transition and, uh, you know, the uh, net zero goals that have to be achieved. So, uh, going forward, uh, you know, uh, since GOI is the promoter of all the three companies, um, uh, so to speak, uh, so it's it, any portion of the rice issue that will happen, which remains unsubscribed, will have to be taken up at the government. Now, it may translate into a slight uptake in the GOI stakes in all of these companies. Uh, it just totally de depends on how the response works out. So while this is on, this process is on by the companies raising money, the government is also simultaneously working on a cabinet approval. So we'll have to keep an eye on that and see how that goes, but uh, it remains to be seen how the right issue is stand up. Okay, Sapna, thank you very much uh, for that important story there. Just a few, se three seconds to go for uh, the markets to open up. Will we have another opening in the green? The first stick on the Nifty is in the red, but it's a flat start, you would say. The Nifty is down 15 points, the Sensex lower by 75 odd points. Uh, there is some pressure which is visible in the HDFC twin. So HDFC Limited, HDFC Bank has opened up on the back foot today. Straight away, you are seeing a knock of close to about 2%. Other notable losers include Aisha Motors. So after the 6-7% fall that we had yesterday, this morning Aisha Motors has opened up in the red. Britannia ITC too, correcting a tad bit. 
In terms of uh, the banking updates, Indescent Bank has been given a thumbs up. The numbers look good and Indescent Bank has opened um, in the green with a gain of close to about 1%. And the other notable one in the uh, banking side is Bandhan Bank. Not a nifty, not a large cap, but Bandhan Bank is down close to about 4% in trade. Uh, ICICI Bank is holding up quite smartly. A couple of IT names are seeing buying. Um, so follow on buying from yesterday for Tech Mahindra, Infosys, uh, HCL Tech currently up close to about half a percent. But the index is still pretty flat, just a very, very minor downtick of about 30 points. So after six days of gains, this morning markets have taken a bit of a breather. Uh, the mid-cap index too in the green but flat. Well, that's right. Uh, you know, let's uh, look at the big deal as well that was announced late last evening between Sinjin and uh, Strides. Sinjin, well, the street has read that positively the stock is up close to a percent and a half. On the flip side, you have Strides. That's down close to around 3%. But keep in mind, in the run-up to this deal, the stock was up more than 10% in this week itself. So it's pulling back some part of that. Emphasis as well as down close to around 3%. Dixon Technologies, Jefferies has gone ahead and they've downgraded the stock because of valuation concerns and also because of the composition of their revenue mix. More than 75% comes in from the OEM segment. So that's why they have highlighted those factors. And valuation-wise, it's trading at around 60 times odd. Uh, in terms of stocks that are doing well, Karnataka Bank, well, that one continues to move up. It's up 2%. And you have LIC Housing Finance. That's up close to around 3.8%. Prashant. Okay, well, it's a bit of a breather. 20 points lower, uh, 19,375 is uh, what we have. And uh, things are looking, uh, you, you know, a little slower. Not a big gap up of, uh, you know, 90, 100 points like what we're used to over the last many sessions. Uh, okay, you know, Motherson is up 5.5% uh, as we pointed out. Genus is con continues to be on a tear. We just had the management with us, 8.5% on that one. Uh, Paytm is coming up, uh, some of these names, Paytm is coming up with about a 3% move, uh, large volumes. LIC Housing Finance is another one, which is coming up with 3.5% gain. Uh, Indescent is higher. Uh, you know, something called HPL, uh, uh, not, uh, H, not HBL, but HPL, 5.5%, but huge volumes in this one. Don't usually see this up, uh, uh, you know, on this list at the, right at the start. Apollo, uh, Col Colgate Palmolive starts about one and a half odd percent higher. Rallys India is up about three and a half odd percent or so. Market breadth is very comfortably in the green. Three is to one in favor of advances uh, at this point. Uh, the losers are uh, HDFC Bank, HDFC, Bandhan, Aishar was down six percent yesterday. It's down another one and a quarter percent or so. Uh, AU Bank is lower, and of course, uh, Dixon, the Jeffries downgrade two percent lower, forty-two seventy-three. Uh, Strides is down 4%. Emphasis is down about 26 So lots of names, actually. And Loda, Macrotech, is down about 3% as well. So uh, market already coming back to being in the flat zone, but this is just the start, the first two or three minutes of trade. Rahul Arora is Chief Executive Officer of Nirmal Bank Institutional Equities. He's with us here in our studios. Rahul, great to have you with us here. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, we get a moment to catch a catch breath. I mean, corrections are also just, they just last if, you know, 30, 40 minutes, like what we saw yesterday, right? We started higher. By 10 o'clock, we were at the day's low at about 19,300 and then spend the day moving up once again. What's the sense? Is it getting a little too fast for everyone's comfort? So, morning, Prashant. Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, so, just I'd reference back to the conversation we had about a month back when I was on the show. I think because the Nifty has spent such a long time in that range of 16,700 to 18,700, uh, I was of the view then that if it broke out, it would probably help to 20,000 before we know it. Uh, I think it's more a technical factor than anything else. Obviously, you're a beneficiary of flows. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think incrementally any data points have turned positive. I think what was positive a month back holds today. Your rupee is stable. The external sector is fine. Crude is still between 70 and 80. So all of that is known. Uh, I was hearing Nigel just talk about uh, one of my competitors downgrading a stock because of valuations. Mm -hmm. That's a concern across the board. I think, uh, you know, it's very difficult to value stocks on FI24. It's becoming very difficult to value stocks on FI25. And part of the reason, Prashant, is, uh, and I don't really fault the buy side, is because whatever liquidity they are getting, they're pretty much buying the same stocks that they already have in their portfolio. So as sell side analysts, you can do one of two things. You either increase your multiple or you increase your time horizon. Or you do the third thing which sell side guys love to do is you do a DCF. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is only three ways you can justify when you can't because you can't increase your earnings beyond a point. So, uh, are valuations stretched at this point? For sure they are. Can this leg take it to 20,000? It can, but it will probably be fueled by liquidity. I think there's still some money is moving away from China. In fact, Prashant, you may have noticed uh, last month mm -hmm. was the highest inflows into the U.S. stock market since October last year. Mm -hmm. So that and, and what's shocking me that this is this is all happening in a very high interest rate regime. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know whether people have started discounting rate cuts in 24 or whatever and started moving beyond. 
But uh, Cetris Paribus, I think valuations in the near term are definitely a challenge. I think fixed income over equities from here probably presents a better opportunity. Rahul, momentum always chases performance, right? And that's what we are seeing across. But what have you made of the provisional updates that we've got from the banking numbers so far? You know, HDFC Bank's advances growth is not that high. Uh, for Bandhan Bank, their loan growth is 7%. Their guidance was for a 20% growth. The CASA numbers for many of the banks have fallen. Uh, so NIMS could remain under pressure. Uh, have what we've seen so far from the provisional banking updates, uh, make, does it make you a bit worried? So I think if you adjust for bill discounting and other factors, I think mm. HDFC Bank's uh, numbers will be about 19-20% on okay. advances. I think the reported is about 15-16%. 13% I, I think. Yeah, Karen, so yeah. I think Bandhan was a bit of a disappointment because both the advances and the deposits came in in high single digits and low double digits. Mm. Uh, but I think the point here is, uh, as we saw the case of Federal Bank last quarter, for example, because that comes to mind immediately where you saw a uh, NIM compression. I think that is probably going to happen for banks over the next couple of quarters because over the last but six, eight months... we've been talking about NIM compression, right? So a, isn't it priced in already? Uh, no, and I'll, it, to some extent, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I think if you look at ICICI Bank's results over the last couple of quarters, they've actually been very good, but the stock's done nothing. So to some extent, I think it's probably priced in. But the point here is, I think when you look at the banking sector as a whole today, you're operating at peak ROA, peak ROE, peak mm. NIMS, peak asset quality, peak credit growth. Everything is peak, Right. From here, if you go into a slowdown, I don't know if you're aware, but the outstanding credit card dues in India today are over 2 lakh crores. It's the highest it's ever been. So if you have a slowdown, you're going to have an issue on retail NPAs going forward as well. Corporates are, are a thing of the past because corporates have delevered. But uh, I don't think banking is going to be the sector from here at a 45, 46,000 bank nifty that will lead the market up. I think there are a lot of other sectors around it. That being said, is there a bottom-up approach? I still think there is. I think there is still a trade left in mm -hmm. PSU banks. Uh, from a valuation standpoint, predominantly SBI and uh, Bank of Baroda, which reported their highest ever return on equity in the last quarter. I think their balance sheets are in excellent shape and neither of them are trading much beyond one. I think a Bank of Baroda may be at 0.8. So mm -hmm. I'd probably be inclined more towards uh, yes. public yes. sectors than as opposed to private sector. But now that we know this new Aftar is going to take shape very soon with the HDFC family, I'd probably stick my neck out and buy it. I think you have to keep in mind, uh, Reema, that at this base, if HGFC Bank is still giving you a 15% growth, mm. you take it uh, any any day of the week. You know, I think when you reach that size, a Hindustan lever is struggling to give you that top-line growth. Infosys is struggling to give you that kind of growth. So I'm giving you parallels from other sectors. Uh, at 2.7 times or 2.6 times, the HDFC Bank to me should so be HDFC a portfolio. So HDFC Bank, Bank of Baroda, State Bank of India, right? I so you're so, comfortable yeah. buying... These banks. I would be. And I think if you want to go down the market cap chain, I think something like a federal bank also looks interesting to us. All right, and that's done very, very well in the last few days as well. You know, that's, that's suddenly come back to life. But uh, we've spoken enough about banks, sir. Raul, and you don't duck this one in terms of picks from the broader markets as well. Last time you joined us, you told us Westlife, that could easily go to around 2,000 rupees despite the big up move that you've seen. Powermec was another stock mm -hmm. that you spoke about as well. Could you fill us in with a couple of names that are looking interesting? Maybe not from a near term horizon, but someone who wants to build a portfolio a uh, couple of names that you all are looking at. So let me turn it back to a sector that I'm very passionate about, which is consumer. Mm -hmm. I think you can look at PNG and Gillette. Okay. Uh, I think uh, if you look at PNG, uh, we're expecting, and if you look at the last 10 years, I think Procter & Gamble has actually had the best top line growth of any FMCG stock uh, in India. Uh, what has hurt them, of course, is margins. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what we are expecting is a 700 basis point margin expansion between 23 and 25. Uh, because, uh, you know, if you look at wax oils and things like that, which go into VIX uh, and other raw mats for Old Spice, uh, and even if you look at the female hygiene part of it, uh, the, bulk, the main raw material is pulp, which has corrected dramatically. Uh, so I think uh, you're probably looking at a 35% earnings compounded in Procter & Gamble. And the valuations, while they'll probably be at 44, 45 times, this is a 100% return on equity, return on capital employed in ROIC company. Okay. The other point is uh, Gillette. I think the stock is now starting to show some growth. Uh, obviously, the Virat Kohli culture and don't <laughs> shave was probably prevalent for a very, very long time. <laughs> but I think if you see the new brand ambassadors that Gillette has gone into with Shubman Gill and Sanju Samson and the like, I think they're trying to send a message with, uh, you know, and the female uh, uh, sort of uh, part of the business as well with Venus, uh, I think Deepika Padukone was a brand ambassador, is doing really well uh, in our last interactions that's growing by over 20%. Uh, so oh. I think 
Uh, Gillette has seen almost a 30% uh, you know, correction from its peak. Mm. So I think a couple of stocks on the consumer side, because valuations are becoming challenging in that part as well, as I was discussing in banking. Yeah. But I think where we're reasonably comfortable on earnings growth, uh, these two could potentially be uh, very good stocks to be holding on to. Very classy names, very mm. good return ratios, very good cash on the books. You, you sleep well at night owning P&G and Gillette. So I think those are a couple of names we definitely look at. Uh, coming back to banks and financials, Bajaj, finance, uh, Rahul, yeah, any thoughts on that one? Buy it. I, I, I'm a buyer. I know there's a threat, uh, partly because the promoter entity of your channel is obviously going to be listing uh, its uh, share in the not too uh, distant future. Uh, but, I mean, look, 30% kind of growth, uh, again, well, like I was talking about base effect with Rima. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's remarkable. I, I don't see, I, I think with consumer durables, uh, the kind of financing that they've done, IDFC first has done a very good job uh, in getting into that. HDFC banks also trying to do its best. Obviously, you know, some stocks, Prashant, like a Bajaj Finance or a DMART or an Asian Paints, uh, some of these names get so priced to perfection that the margin for error is very, very little. And then you sort of get a 10, 15% fall. But the interesting part, Prashant, is that these stocks don't fall too much because, you know, anything that you see as a slight setback also will be seen as a buying opportunity by institutional investors. So uh, I have no problem buying, uh, you know, even a Chola for that matter. I think some of these stocks are expensive for a reason and there are some stocks that are cheap for a reason. So I think if any opportunity you get to buy into names like Bajaj Finance or Chola, maybe, you know, the erstwhile HDFC, which was obviously now going to HDFC Bank, these would be buys for me at, at all points in time. So... 30% growth on this base is absolutely remarkable. Rahul, you track the retail, the consumption, the QSR space very closely. Uh, what's the feedback on the ground? Channel checks with your conversations with management. So uh, I think there is definitely a slowdown post Diwali. And I, let me explain it to you very simplistically, right? If you take an uh, urban metro tier one, uh, you know, person who's may, maybe say making north of 25, 30 lakhs of a CTC, right? Mm. You probably have a situation where that person spends about 10,000 rupees a week if you go to a decent restaurant or a movie. So that's about 40,000 rupees a month and about 4 lakh, 80,000 rupees a year. So let's take about 5 lakh rupees a year. And let's say COVID lasted for about 18 months at peak. Mm. So that's about seven and a half lakhs worth of savings that you had. The economy well and truly opened up only around April last year. So when people say that what's happening is structural, I question that because I still think a lot of this is revenge or whatever, that savings that's coming in. And my sense is as you approach 2024, you're going to see a bit of a slowdown in consumption going forward because a lot of this, uh, also uh, don't forget Rima, FY22 was a record year for financial services. Buy side, sell side, banking bonuses were anywhere between 50 to 100 percent on CTC. So consumption got a huge boost, uh, you know, over the last 12 to 18 months. This is not going to be sustainable. You need to be a little wary. You need to find companies in consumption that are going to be sort of beat that. Like I was saying, uh, you know, which are very, very close, where consumers are not going to leave that product. So PNG consumer, if a woman's consuming it, she's not going to leave it. If a guy is consuming Gillette, right. he's not going to leave it, so on and so forth. Uh, on QSRs, like I've said in the past, I think Westlife has done a remarkable job. You look at the two years in the build-up to the pandemic, the pandemic period and the 18 months post, it's outperformed on same store sales growth to any other company, including Jubilant Foodworks, which is a delivery business. So mm. I still think in the near term, valuations are definitely a concern at 60 times price to earning. But the slowdown is going to get reflected in the earnings of next... FI25, I think. So FI24 right now, will manage. we're not at the risk of any earnings downgrade in the upcoming No, and I'll tell season. you why. Because oh. the, when you say earnings, a lot of this is going to come through EBITDA margin expansion. Right. I think if you look at palm oil prices, crude oil prices, okay. they've all collapsed, right? Mm. So whether it's a Lever, Britannia, Godrej, they're all going to give you. You know, Rima, let me put it into perspective. From 2013 to 2023, Lever grew its top line only by 8.8% compounded. But the margins went from 13%, 14% to 25%. And they compounded earnings by 17, 18%. That's why the stock went from 300 to 3,000. Yeah. I think consumption, even going forward over the next 12 to 18 months, is going to be more a margin expansion and earnings story yeah. rather than a volume growth story. Okay, all right. And final question then in terms of autos. Uh, we just had the monthly numbers. We've got a couple of big uh, launches as well mm -hmm. that are... You're more a car person, the plush cars, the fast cars. <laughs> but uh, what do you make of the two-wheeler premium biking segment out there? Because that's going to be quite interesting, particularly for me as a consumer, not, not from a stock market perspective. No, so I think it's a very interesting question because, uh, you know, the only person who can lose market share is who has it, right? Yeah. There was a time Maruti had 100% market share in the auto market. Mm. Uh, so obviously, Aishar is going to face a little bit of heat from Hero. Mm. The question is, what does that 93% market share in that segment come down to? Can it come down to 70%? I don't think so. 
right? I know Hero has its own distribution, but this is going to be a slightly longer term game. When you talk about monthly sales numbers, just look at the last one year and you'll get your answer. iShare has outperformed everyone else by some margin. In fact, even for the last month, mm. while everyone was struggling, iShare grew 20%. So if you actually did not have Hero launching the Harley, uh, you know, bike yesterday, mm. there's a good chance that Aisha would have been up four five percent yesterday because of the strong auto numbers. Yes. So I don't see it as too much of a threat. I think it's a twenty seven percent return on capital employed company, almost a twenty one percent return on equity. The good thing in the Hero's favor, uh, Nigel, is that it's a five percent dividend yield company by FY twenty five. So you know that is a very very big factor when when, when we are forecasting our numbers. But I don't think there's too much of a, a, a difference on the return ratios. But I think the growth that Aisha will show will in FY24 be double of what Hero will show. I think Hero will probably give you a 12% top line growth. Aisha will be 24%. So I'm still comfortable paying the valuations. I think you probably use yesterday's correction to buy into the stock. If I was to own something in the mass market, I'd play Hero. Mm. But uh, in premium, if I was to buy only one stock in two wheelers, it would definitely be Aisha. Oh, good thought. You know, when we were growing up, Rahul, uh, when we were dreaming about riding a big bike, there was just one. The youngsters today are lucky. You know, they'll have three, four in the next uh, next few months. So you're young enough that. yourself, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for that. Pleasure. Jana. Thank you for having me. In fact, let's take this auto discussion forward. Uh, Hero Motor Corp and Bajaj Auto are betting big on the premium motorcycle segment. Hero Motor, together with Harley, announced the launch of X440. And Bajaj Auto today will be launching the 400cc Triumph motorcycle. Does this heat up competition, especially for Aisha Motors? We have with us Vasudev Banerjee of ICSA Securities, Rohit Paradkar, Senior Assistant Editor at Overdrive, and Jay Kali of Ilara Capital. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining in. Um, let's first talk about Aisha Motors. You know, Vasudev and Jay, and we'd like your comments on it. Rahul just told us the only person at risk um, in this is the person who has the market share, and that's Aisha with a near 90% um, you know, market share in the premium motorcycle segment. Um, yesterday, the stock price fell, but Rahul said he's comfortable buying it at current levels. Vasudev, your thoughts on Aisha Motors as things currently stand? Yeah, so uh, the very uh, point what you mentioned that the only person, uh, the company who can face risk is who has the market share. But uh, if you look at uh, examples, say in the SUV space, where uh, so many launches happened in the segments like Creta or Seltos, what created in last uh, six, eight years, uh, they were hardly existing in the market. So today, if you look at within the bike market, 350cc plus segment uh, contribute hardly 7% of the market against 14, 15% in other developing markets. So the scope for the market to expand itself is there, which will in case absorb the supply from uh, new quality uh, OEMs like uh, a Triumph or a Harley. And one more important aspect, if you look at, is in last uh, five years, where uh, total cost of ownership of a premium bike has increased by almost 40%, with the same classic, which on-road price being from 1,80,000 up to 2,30,000. Uh, but uh, the demand has only increased and the percentage mix in the bike market has increased. Now, finally, when there are no more such inflationary pressures, on the TCO for a premium bike. I won't be surprised if the market itself expands and uh, absorbs this new supply. Yes, uh, Aisha Motors market share being at 90% plus definitely should be under pressure, but uh, anybody at 90% market share can't sustain at those levels uh, for a prolonged period. And that is very much, I suppose, uh, factored in the price uh, per se. Hmm. Uh <clears throat> Got that. Uh, Jay, would you uh, broadly sort of agree with that assessment uh, that, uh, you know, the guy with 90% has got the most to lose? Uh, but how does that translate into a view on the stock, Jay, in your opinion? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, uh, you will see, like, you know, Basu said that, uh, of course, uh, there, there will be some bit of market expansion. Consumers have more uh, options now, uh, you know, versus largely one option now. They probably will have three credible options. Uh, going forward. So definitely market expansion is something that will uh, uh, happen. But one also needs to see that, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, price increases that we've, uh, for this segment as well as the overall two-wheeler segment. And RE being one of kind of 90% market share, it had the leeway of taking uh, those price increases. But now with uh, the extremely uh, kind of competitive pricing from uh, Harley, and we need to see what Bajaj comes in. 
the competition is definitely heated up over here and that could uh, to a certain extent restrict uh, RE's ability to take price hikes uh, going forward as well. Uh, so, and also, uh, you know, of course, at current prices, uh, definitely, uh, uh, you know, the stock has corrected, but valuations are still not cheap if we have to uh, speak about uh, iShare. And uh, with market share coming in with pricing ability probably being not as strong as what it was uh, earlier with these launches, uh, there could still uh, be some downside left. Uh, so, currently, we have a sell rating on iShare. Hmm. Uh, Rohit Paratkar of Overdrive is also with us. Uh, Rohit uh, had a chance to look at the Harley and the Triumph uh, bike as yet. Uh, you know, uh, not the Triumph one. The Triumph will that's happen gonna today. That's going to be today. Uh, we are, yeah, one o'clock. Yes, we are waiting for that. Uh, a little while from now, it should be out. Okay, but you did have a feel from it when it launched in London uh, last week, right? Sort of, yes. Uh, sort so of. I think, uh, you know, I'll I'll go with what everyone's saying here. And that's absolutely right that there are now more options, uh, you know, in the segment. And more options are not uh, always good. But this time around, it's going to be extremely nice because uh, the market has matured now. And uh, these options are uh, exactly what, uh, you know, the market wanted. Mm. So uh, thoughts on uh, Hero? Pricing looks attractive. The specifications, you know, look pretty good. How do you see this premium motorcycle segment playing out from here on? See, I think it's going to be very interesting because, uh, see, there are two approaches that we've seen uh, in the past, right? We've seen Yezdi, Java, Honda all trying to break that uh, Royal Enfield uh, barrier. And no one's really been able to uh, worry Royal Enfield so much. Uh, even today, like you said, uh, they're uh, enjoying a 90% share. But now with Harley and Triumph coming in, things are going to get very interesting because, see, typically... Uh, people aspire to upgrade from a Royal Enfield to a Harley Davidson or a Triumph motorcycle. There are other brands as well, but uh, these two, obviously. And now with these two brands entering Royal Enfield space, uh, you know, and that too at tempting price tags. And again, uh, finance is also uh, pretty easy to uh, get these days. Uh, so customers are definitely going to have options. They're also going to have the spending capacity. And, uh, you know, these vehicles look very good, not just in terms of uh, the way they appear, but also on uh, the spec sheet. So, uh, it's going to be very interesting uh, here on because Harley and Triumph are two very big brands that are entering uh, this segment and probably they will have a better chance uh, than what ESD, Java or Honda have had in the past. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> no, got that. In terms of pricing, uh, <clears throat> if I can sort of uh, ask you, and we will, of course, know today afternoon, uh, Rohit, do you think it, uh, uh, Bajaj will find it harder to price their product uh, above, uh, you know, what uh, Hero has done for Harley? So, I mean, I'm that sure it's it... going to come at yeah, a premium. Uh, I'm definitely sure mm -hmm. it's going to come at a premium. I don't think, uh, you know, they will be able to price it uh, neck to neck with the Harley Davidson, uh, the X440 mm -hmm. that we've seen. I think it's going to be more because uh, the equipment that we've seen on that vehicle, uh, the kind of tires they're using, the suspension, uh, you know, even uh, the overall quality, uh, the fit and finish, it all seems uh, to point in the direction of a more premium price tag. So, I mm -hmm. am sure that they are going to go a little closer to the KTM 390s in terms of their pricing because even in terms of the specs and the performance, uh, they are sort of targeting that segment and it's only the design uh, or the appearance where they are going with that modern retro approach that Royal Enfield has been known for uh, all these years. So they are trying to hit that midway point where they are giving you KTM performance and Royal Enfield uh, kind of uh, modern retro designs. So I'm gu guessing the price also is going to be in between. It's not going to be as low as a Royal Enfield or even for that matter the Harley Davidson X440 uh, but it is going to go more towards the KTM 390s. That's my estimate. Mm. Uh, Vasudev, uh, getting back to the auto sales numbers, what according to you, the reason, you know, what was the reason for Hero Motor Corp's dismal performance? Auto sales numbers down 10% uh, volumes in the month of uh, June. What's hurting them? And do you anticipate a recovery? So if you uh, look at the retail numbers, uh more or less, uh, this is the last month of marriage season, and uh, more or less, nobody will be willing to pile up inventory at this juncture, especially uh, with festive season being uh, in late October this year, unlike uh, early October or late September in previous year. So that's why, uh, I suppose, post-July, uh, your wholesales will start looking good as a precursor to festive season uh, inventory getting added in the system. But if you look at uh, the retail numbers, they, are, they were pretty much normal. So nothing much to take merely from the wholesale numbers as such. Okay. All right, gentlemen. Thanks so much uh, for joining in and giving us your view 
on this exciting premium bike segment. Let's see how that shapes up. For the time being, though, let's shift focus. Goldridge Properties, that's a stock on our radar. My colleague Sonal Butra spoke to Gaurav Pandey, the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Goldridge Properties, in his first ever TV interview after taking over as MD and CEO. She began by asking him about the land acquisition spree in Gurugram, as well as Kolkata, and the company's business development pipeline. Let's listen in to what he had to tell Sonal. Uh, you know, Godrish Properties, as you rightly said, is in a very exciting stage where we're looking at investment opportunities across key geographies where we operate. Uh, last financial year, we did close to about 80 transactions. Uh, our guidance to the market was adding 15,000 crores worth of booking value logged in projects. And we did close to about 32,000 crores uh, worth of uh, booking value logged in to 18 transactions. And we're very confident that this will fuel the kind of profitable growth that we are envisioning for ourselves. And we're continuing that momentum, but selectively in areas where we believe there is very strong demand. And we are seeing uh, you know, consistent great sales momentum, reducing our inventory in those markets. And uh, the recent ones, you're right, the two transactions, quarter one we've done, which we've kind of already announced, one is in Kolkata, a very prime micro market of Kolkata in New Alipur, uh, close to about 7.44 acres of a transaction, leading to about 1200 crores of potential top line, uh, and uh, another transaction, which is in Gurgaon. So very excited on the growth momentum we set ourselves for. Okay, so the 15,000 crore rupees of uh, development value that you've guided for, uh, do you think, uh, uh, first of all, how much of that have you done in quarter one already? And do you think last, uh, like last year, there is a possibility of exceeding that as well? Uh, you know, so essentially the way we are driven by uh, business development opportunities is out of market, uh, you know, what kind of opportunity you get to see in market. Uh, while we did, we have given a guidance of about 15,000 crores, but our efforts are not necessarily targeting uh, to necessarily either get that or even exceed that. Uh, we are driven by what kind of underwriting assumptions we are very confident upon and what kind of uh, pricing we are getting from a land market point of view. So at the moment, it looks very bright for us. Uh, we've identified certain micro markets in India where we want to deepen our presence or get into within the four key geographies where we operate. So within that, uh, reasonably confident that our trajectory will continue. Okay, all right. So I'll come back to that in just a bit. But when you spoke about land acquisition, at least in FI23, Gozrish Properties was one uh, company which uh, saw the highest land acquisition, at least in the organized space. And this is coming at a time when, you know, 2021, 2020, uh, where companies spoke of an asset light model. What is the strategy here right now? And in terms of pricing as well, how does it differ uh, pre-COVID versus now when it comes to land acquisition? See, if you see, take a step back and see overall, you know, real estate market because land buying decisions are, uh, you know, kind of guided by what you see as opportunities to create impact in the real estate cycle where you operate. So pre-COVID, largely for about 10 to 12 years, we were operating in a very bearish real estate market and which is a very uh, typical of cyclical market that real estate does see. Uh, Post-COVID, we saw the uh, first stage of growth uh, to another 10 years of our up cycle. And we're at a very early stage right now, and we see that there is good pricing uh, we're able to kind of uh, achieve in terms of projects that we are selling in the geographies we operate, which has led to a, a sort of a very focused approach on what kind of investment opportunities we would like to funnel and kind of accentuate our growth, uh, both through profitability and booking value. Now, uh, coming to your uh, question on the structure of the transaction asset light versus outright transactions, we are frankly not uh, governed by uh, the structure construct right now. What we are guided by is the principles of uh, return thresholds that we want to secure for ourselves. And uh, in certain sensitivity analysis, we run what kind of uh, pricing and margins we will to achieve even in different kinds of market scenarios. We are seeing currently, uh, coincidentally, those transactions happen to be outright. Uh, that is not, is frankly, uh, demonstrating out of our conscious strategy to outright only. We have a good pipeline of even JD projects. It is just that we did a couple of bid participations and we want those bid participations which were led by government itself. And we saw great uh, projects in certain geographies where landowners were keen to do it through an outright transaction, which has uh, led to the kind of growth. And fortunately, because of this and being at the start of an upcycle, 
our ability to command better margins uh, because our economic interest in each of these projects happens to be larger, we will have a potential upside coming from it. But uh, honestly, it was not driven out of construct to do only upgrades, just pure market opportunities and what we can create as win-win for ourselves and landowners. Okay, that makes sense and that explains a lot as well because uh, land acquisition uh, is something that is very specific to the cycle that you're in as well. Uh, take that point. Uh, Gaurav, uh, let's talk about cash flows because quarter four was really good for your cash flows, record high there. But I was looking at the quarterly trend. Operating cost cash flows have been around 20 to 22% of the total cash flows. Now that surged to 50% in quarter four. First, what led to that? Uh, what is the cash flow cycling look, cycle looking like? And whatever capex that you have in place coming ahead as well, will it be funded via internal accruals? Will you be taking more debt for that? What is the plan there? Uh, see, essentially, if you see our business has uh, elements of cash inflow planned from two, three variables. One is your ability to launch a project on time. Uh, then you construct a project. You get to see if you sell a particular phase, uh, by about 60% plus within a launch. And if you have uh, right kind of payment plans, uh, largely when a project is about 60 to 70% uh, plus of construction, you start hitting uh, operating cash flow positive. Uh, that's the typical, typical thumb rule. Of course, there are projects where it tends to be a little faster and some exceptions, uh, even from a later point of view. Uh, and most of it, if you see why it happened on Q4 is because we had very heavy OC calendar in quarter four of previous financial year. So of course, when your uh, operating cash flows are governed by your COC or cost of construction is covered, you're enjoying that surplus operating cash flows in quarter four. That's typical of the nature of business we have. It is more lumpy towards H2. Uh, yeah. So, and from a uh, pure cash flow planning point of view, we are largely looking at it from an internal accruals and a combination of uh, you know projects which we have launched earlier a uh, couple of years back. Uh, which have driven OC and some phases are left. We're completing those and we're getting good surplus uh, cash flow. And we are very confident as uh, positive that this year will continue to be a very exciting year for us. In fact, if you notice, uh, Godrish Properties last year delivered close to about 8,900 crores and 90 crores of uh, sort of collections number, which is higher than the booking value number of the previous financial year, which is a very interesting aberration purely reflecting from late collections efficiency and uh, you know faster con construction completion giving us those kind of collections and therefore positive operating cash flows okay and it is important for real estate companies right the collections that you get the cash flows as well because that is very important for investors to track as well a uh, couple of more uh, macro level questions that i wanted to understand from you because you are a market leader um, what is the pricing scenario right now we've seen that there is a pause in interest rate so to say uh, but do you think you will be able to push price hikes further or the price hikes that have happened in the last two to three years will consolidate at these levels? Uh, see, again, pricing, if you see, is very characteristic of different micro markets in the cities we operate. So if you see, uh, in the last two odd years, NCR has been leading the price appreciation chart for us and for most developers operating out of that market. And uh, there is a good continued trend. We are seeing uh, sort of a secular trend in the micro markets of other geographies, but not to the accelerated level that we have witnessed in the North market, so as to speak. So first, there is a reasonable probability to say that uh, given there is such a strong demand uh, for end user driven products in good micro markets, it's a fair case to assume that there is a reasonable probability that price to some extent uh, would continue to grow. To what extent it will depend upon frankly product location and timing of, of, of the cycle that we operate. But uh, till now, we've been able to demonstrate consistent price increase and consistent sales in the last financial year. So with, with some cautious optimism, I would say, uh, I think we are at the right cycle where uh, there is some amount of good upsides if market continues what it's presenting as opportunities right now. Interesting conversation there with Sonal and Godrej Properties. Get into a break. On the other side, we'll talk one of the big movers of the day. That's Madison Sumi. The stock has surged 8.3% following the acquisition of Honda's subsidiary, Yachio's four-wheeler business. Uh, we'll be joined by the top management of Samvardhan Madison International on the other side.
Welcome back. This is Corporate Radar. The stock of the morning is clearly auto parts maker Samvardhan Madison, which is surge 8.5% after the company announced it will acquire an 81% stake in Japanese company Yachio's four-wheeler business. Yachio, remember, is a subsidiary of Honda Motors. To discuss more on this development, we are joined by uh, the company's director, Lakshvaman Segal, and the CFO, Kunal Malani, on the show. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining in and congratulations. Uh, Mr. Segal, this is a big partnership with Honda where you will be holding 81% stake in Yachio's four-wheeler business uh, and Honda will continue to hold on about a 19% stake. Just want to first understand, uh, how much are you going to be paying in? Is there any debt on Yachio's books? Uh, because purely when we look at the equity in you know equity value of the acquired company at 140 145 million dollars and the revenues of 800 plus million euros it appears to be that the ev to sales is quite less less than 0.2x uh, so are there any hidden costs is there debt on yachio's books look uh, there'll be a net cash position when we uh, take this company over i'll let uh, kunal explain the the deal transaction to you but i think the uh, the outside what's important to understand is that Madhusan has been handpicked by Honda San for this asset. This is a very strategic asset for Honda San. It has a rich history of development of products. It has a leadership uh, in its products such as sunroofs and the fuel tanks that it does. But not only that, in the past, it's also done plastic tailgates. Uh, it's, it's assembled full vehicles for Honda San. So really a, a company that is very rich in engineering, a, very, uh, a company that has a lot of capability uh, and has really um, also copied the footprint of Honda, Honda San globally. Uh, which allows us, uh, Mother Sun, to bring in a lot more products uh, to Honda Sun for their future offerings and also take their existing products such as the sunroofs uh, and the plastic fuel tanks and their capability in the other products to our existing customer base uh, for growth for, for Yachio. Uh, a very, very strong R&D company, three locations, uh, R&D locations um, and a very rich history of bringing products to market. Uh, with very, very high um, quality, obviously, uh, expectations from the customer uh, and been very successful at that. From a transaction structure perspective, uh, we would be buying 81% of Yachio's four-wheeler business. Uh, this will be for 145 million euro equivalent or 23 billion GPY for 100%. So the 81% would be around about 19 billion GPY or around 117 million euros. Uh, uh, from a transaction structure perspective, uh, first, after this announcement that we have done, we will be applying for antitrust approvals. Post that, uh, Honda San will be making a tender offer. Uh, they are already holding 50.4%. Uh, they will require to at least get 66.67 or two thirds of the asset, uh, and then they can take this asset private as per the Japanese regulations. Uh, assuming they are able to take this uh, private, they will then buy the two-wheeler business out of Yachio. And then what is remaining is the four-wheeler business, which we will then acquire 81% for, as I said, the 117, 118 million euros from Honda Sun. And Honda Sun will retain the, the 19%. Now, uh, as of today, uh, Yachu is a net cash uh, balance sheet business. Uh, with this being expected to go to Q1 FY25 from a closure perspective, between now and then, we anticipate the net cash position to remain, maybe even accrete from where it is today. Uh, and hence, the enterprise value is likely to be lower than the equity value. Okay. Uh... <clears throat> You know, just to, uh, Kunal, to you, uh, what will this acquisition take your overall debt levels to and what would the net debt to EBITDA levels look like? Sure. Uh, so uh, we will be taking debt to acquire this asset, as you would appreciate uh, uh, the terms are such that, uh, you know, the leverage here uh, is not going to be a concern. Uh, even after considering all the announced acquisitions that we have done till date uh, and which will get consummated over the next, let's say, six to 12 months, uh, we still anticipate the aggregate net debt to EBITDA to be less than two times uh, by the time this transaction is, is done as well. So much below our threshold of two and a half times, that we, our financial policy of two and a half times. Uh, Kunal, you're saying the net debt to EBITDA would go up to 2x. 
that's substantially higher because I think you ended FI23 with a net debt to EBITDA 1.4x. I understand it's still below the company's threshold of 2.5x, but it's still a pretty you know, big jump in net debt to EBITDA. Would you be looking to bring it down? And once again, what would the absolute debt number stand at? Hi, maybe I'll be a little conservative when I'm saying 2x. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, we'll be much below 2x, maybe closer to to where we are. Uh, there is a uh, the SaaS acquisition that we had announced uh, a few months back uh, that is expected to close uh, sometime in the next few months, uh, where the exact consideration will be known at that particular point in time. Uh, but uh, from where we are, our organic business should anyway be deleveraging, uh, and in spite of some of the organic growth that we have already announced. We do anticipate this to be, you know, less than two x, uh, possibly maybe closer to where we are only. Uh, uh, but yeah, as time comes, we will we will talk about it because the exact timing of some of these acquisition closure is still in the works. So difficult to have uh, a foresight around it. But as I said, existing business deleveraging, new organic growth, adding uh, aggregate level, uh, certainly below two x, maybe closer to where we are. All right, uh, Mr. Segel, uh, this will mark Samuel's entry into a new segment, that's sunroofs as well as fuel tanks, which have a revenue contribution of around 3% each. Now, considering the opportunity to cross-sell, how much can this scale up to in terms of contribution? Yes, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, um, our chairman, uh, my father, I set the vision for the company to be, you know, 3CX10, no customer, no country, no component to be more than 10% of our business. Uh, Yachio fits in there beautifully. It adds uh, the sunroof component, which uh, we're not really there uh, in a meaningful way, and the plastic fuel tank capability that they have, and other fuel tank capabilities for such as hybrids, um, and and of course, um, you know, hydrogen tanks when uh, when they when they come, they have full capability uh, uh, and engineering expertise to really be able to continue to develop that. Um, Honda Sun, as you know, has has very high. Uh, quality requirements. Um, you know they they produce some of the best cars in the world. Um, so if these products are able to satisfy their requirements, we are quite confident that uh, taking these products to other customers as well, um, we will we will get traction. Uh, of course, um, we're only talking about the four wheelers here. These these products are also to be used in off road vehicles, commercial uh, uh, commercial vehicles. Uh, so really, a lot of possibilities really open up for Madhusan. Um, and also, you know, only 90% uh, uh, of the share of this goes to Honda Sun. 10% is already uh, the, what the company Gachio has been uh, able to break into with the other customers, which again opens the doors uh, more for Honda Sun products to come in. So really, a, a two-way street. Of course, Honda Sun will get access to all of Mother Sun's uh, technologies and, and portfolio, and uh, bring Honda Sun as a, in, a, in a meaningful way uh, to our customer split. Um, and Gachio will, of course. Uh, add to our product offerings that we can to our existing customers. Uh, Mr. Sehgal, right now you're going to be holding a 18, sorry, 81% stake in Yachio, while Honda will hold the balance 19%. Is there any kind of, you know, you know, conversation between the two? Any plan to take on Honda's stake of 19%? Do you have a right of first refusal? Have they indicated how long they plan to continue holding on to a minority stake? Look, we are uh, honored to have this partnership with Honda Sun. Uh, of course, uh, they have indicated to us that it, they, are, they are planning to hold on to this 19%, but uh, in the longer term, these are some things to be decided together with them. Um, but I think the, the very important thing is that they continue to hold that stake, that 19%, even this, once this transaction is done, uh, because they believe in uh, Mother Sun's vision. They believe that Mother Sun can bring uh, a lot of uh, product technologies to their offerings globally, uh, and they believe in Madhusan as a partner. So, of course, uh, uh, you know, things down the road, we will continue to assess, discuss with Honda Sun, uh, but this partnership will, will continue regardless of the of the shareholding, um, and we believe it's uh, it's something that uh, we are quite excited about, uh, and we'll open a lot of gates for, for Madhusan. All right, uh, Kunal, uh, you know, your vision for 2025 was already laid out. Revenues of close to around $36 billion with 40% ROC and 40% dividend payout. Now, with this acquisition, what will the aggregate revenue look like? Because I think you've done a few more acquisitions as well. So how do things shape up now? 
more acquisitions yes uh, we've always had a pipeline as we have mentioned again and again uh, i think the times are, are turning favorable for players like us which have a stronger balance sheet as the rest of the world goes through both operational as well as financial stress so we are getting more and more traction from an oems to be able to offer more and more assets to us and and we look forward to you know doing more uh, for sure. Uh, from a revenue perspective, uh, you know, if you consider our, our Route 36 construct, we are at 12.7 today. Uh, SAS on a gross revenue will add uh, five odd billion among the other transactions. Together with this is another billion. Uh, and then the organic growth on top. So maybe we will be hitting somewhere between 19 to 20 odd billion already if you were to assimilate these transactions today. Uh, and then there's more to it. So yes, we are we are on our way to 36 for sure. Okay, so on track to achieve 36 billion dollars of revenue by 2025. But you gave us a number of 19 to 20 billion dollars in terms of revenues. Is this the number today, or is this the number which you will achieve by the end of FY24? Uh, by the F FY25, we will be closer to the 19 to 20 billion mark. Uh, that's the time frame by which these assets will be assimilated uh, pretty much completely. Uh, but as I said, between now and uh, March 25, uh, hopefully there are there are more inorganic and organic growths that we can announce. Okay, and there'll be more acquisitions, but you will make sure that your net debt to EBITDA stays below two and a half x. Always. That has been our financial policy, uh, and we will stick to that. All right, Mr. Segal, uh, why have you kept the two-wheeler business outside of the partnership? If you tell us, uh, give us some kind of rationale for that. Look, this uh, two-wheeler business of uh, Goshi was never a scope uh, of the transaction. It was always uh, kept aside by Honda San. Um, we were focused on the four-wheeler business, which was what was the request from Honda San for us to look at. Um, I think this question is perhaps a better asked to them um, why they felt that uh, they would like to retain that. But regardless of that, I think, again, uh, our strengths are in their product portfolio that they're offering to the four-wheelers. Um, this is where we can uh, add considerable synergies to it. We can add on more customers uh, and also take these technologies to our existing customers. Uh, so, you know, even without the two-wheeler business, this complete thing is, is extremely exciting for us, opens up a lot of doors, uh, and we're quite excited to close the transaction and uh, deliver a, a strong growth and rosy from this business. Uh, Mr. Segal, uh, Mr. Malani, thank you very much for joining in. Need to slip into a very short break on that note with the news that markets are still very, very quiet. So the first one hour of trade has been practically done and the Nifty hasn't moved too much, just shy of the 19,400 mark. Mid-caps, though, are holding up quite well with a gain of nearly 0.3%. On the other side, our stocks which are on the move.
Welcome back. Well, the markets are as flat as can be, but the mid-cap index is doing a relative outperformance today, and we have still close to around two stocks that are advancing from one stock that's declining. Let's talk about some of the big gainers at around 10 a.m. mod. Genius Bar, that stock is flying away. They've done a deal with GIC. Surbhi joins us to tell us more about that. Surbhi? Thanks for that, Nigel. So GIC and, uh, and Genius Power will together invest $2 billion to build a smart metering solutions platform. Now, in this JV, GIC will hold 74% stake and the Genius will hold the remaining 26% stake. For this platform, specifically, Genius would be the exclusive supplier to the platform and the platform will bid for smart meter projects in India. Now, additionally, another GIC affiliate uh, is going to invest close to 520 crores in Genius Power for 15% stake through the stock warrant. Now, management joined us earlier and they said that this 520 crores that comes through the preference issue will be used uh, towards the platform and Genius will become a system integrator in the joint venture while GIC will become, come as a financial investor. And 60 to 70% of the order value that comes from this JV will come to the listed company. So that is why you can see Genius Power is surging in trade today. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for that, uh, Surbhi. Well, Ikta joins us to tell us about Strides Pharma as well as Sinjin. They're moving in opposite directions post that deal that was announced late, late last night. Ekta? Thanks for that. Well, yes, uh, the news is uh, largely positive. While Sinjin is going to let go of around 700 odd crores, it is increasing its capacity. Maybe the street is worried about uh, the change in terms of the facility that uh, they will be acquiring from Stellis Biopharma, which is basically an arm of strides. Now, just the news, uh, they will be basically Stellis, which is the Biopharma CDMO arm of strides, is going to be selling its Unit 3 multimodal facility for 702 crores or $86 million to Sinjin. Now, uh, Sinjin is going to acquire the unit on a slump sale basis. The consideration is expected to be settled in cash. Transaction to close in around 90 odd days. Now, for Sinjin, maybe the worry is that the facility was initially built to manufacture COVID-19 vaccines. They will be investing an additional 100 crores now. This will be basically to repurpose the facility in order to manufacture monoclonal antibodies and to repurpose and revalidate the plant and help strengthen their position eventually in the CDMO business. So there is this transition period for Sinjin which they will have to go through which we would probably take there might be a gestation period in order to see the results from this particular plan. Now for Stellis however they are getting 700 crores in terms of cash in Q4 the company had indicated that they are looking at strategic options for the company. The total amount of debt which was paid by the consolidated entity of the group was 720 crores in FY23 and they had indicated that they are confident of reducing the net debt to a bit to around 3x versus an exit of around 3.4 times in FY23. So this is probably going to help aid in terms of the total debt reduction. Uh, the company Stellis will continue to expand via two more units that they have, Unit 1 and Unit 2. And Unit 2 is also approved by other regulators such as the US FDA. Okay. All right, Ekta. Thanks a lot for that. Well, time to slip into a short break now. But on the other side, our special segment is the economy. Now we'll get chatting with uh, Mr. S.S. Mundra, the former Deputy Governor at RBI, and Suresh Ganapati of Macquarie Capital Securities, and also Lakshmi Iyer of Kotak Investment Advisors. They'll be talking about the impact of the HDFC Twins merger on the banking as well as the NBFC sector. Stay with us for that conversation. 